our turn. Um, he turned the steering wheel. How do they turn the car uh, with the steering wheel? <laughs> yeah, I wish it was that simple. I mean, you know, the driver puts an input through the steering wheel. Once you turn the steering wheel, then the through the reaction of the steering column and the input goes through what we call a steering shaft to a Kiava unit. To the steering arms. And when the bar moves, it moves a steering link, which is connected to the upright. To the unsprung mass. Hubs which turn the wheels. Then to the chassis. And therefore moves the, the wheel, the steer wheel, which in our car is a front wheel. Which then turn the tires. Then to the tire. From straight ahead, the tire starts to twist. That starts to bend the contact patch and those forces start to point in the direction that the driver has pointed the wheel. You know, so as the driver turns the steering wheel, the steer wheels turn and the car starts to change direction, hopefully in a controlled manner. It's that changing of the direction of the forces and the tire's contact patch that ultimately generate the cornering power of the, for the vehicle and cause the car to go around the corner. And then finally the tire reacts and then feeds back through that entire system again to tell the driver what he's just done. And that's the start of the turn. What, what other characteristic about tires that I think some people don't really appreciate is how little contact area is actually generating all the forces necessary to make a race car go around a track. The analogy I like to use is that a pair of size 10 tennis shoes have roughly the same contact area as your race tire and not a big race tire. So you're asking a, something the size of your tennis shoes which you rely on to deal with maybe one horsepower and you're careful on a slippery surface, you're asking a car with five or 600 horsepower that can go 180 miles an hour and corner at multiple Gs to do that with something not much bigger than the size of your tennis shoes. In a really high speed corner, you know, so turn one in Sebring or anything high speed, a lot of the time, you know, you really, you know, these LMP cars are really massed in downforce. So a lot of the time it's about, you know, you know minimizing the brake, minimizing anything that's gonna slow the car down. And it's usually a much more progressive, smooth input because because you've got the downforce, you can be you have to work less to get the car to, to do what you want it to do. But obviously, in a, a, a tighter con like a hairpin, obviously it's a, it's a tighter radius, so you have to use more steering, um, more lock to get the car to, to turn the corner. But you can influence, influence that also with braking. If you're hard on the brakes and the car's you know pitching into the corner, and all the weight's on the front axle, and you turn the wheel, it may turn a lot better than if you're coming off the brake. So. There's all these things. It's almost like standing on a beach ball and juggling at the same time. You know, there's, there's so many different things going on. Um, and actually, if you actually probably really sit and think about it, there's a lot of things going on. But when you drive in, you kind of just do it by the seat of your pants. You, your, bum, your bum and your inner ear are feeling so many different things that you just, your body just reacts to it. And it, it's almost a subconscious feeling. You, you, you're doing it without really thinking about it. Um, but sometimes when the car's not performing, very well, and, 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 it's, and it's an inconsistent feeling. Then you really find yourself really thinking about it. And when you start thinking about it, that usually means you're going slow. So, I mean, that's usually the difference between a good lap and you know, a slow lap is, is, is what, what feedback. I mean, as a driver, it's all about feel. It's all about feedback. If you get the feel and you get the feedback, it gives you the confidence to push. Um, and that's, that's something that we're always looking for. And if we haven't got that, then you know, we're, always gonna, we're always gonna hold back that little bit just, just because we don't know what the car's gonna do. So uh, it's all about feel. You know, all we are, you know, as a driver, we're a soft computer when we're out there. And, and you know, we've gotta interpret what's going on with the car, uh, what's going on with the tires at speed and make informed judgment. And the whole time you're trying to manage risks, right? So there's things that just don't appear on black and white that we as drivers have to deal with. But at the same time, it's still a machine. And you've got to get the machine to, to work around the human limitations, you know, what we need, what we want, to feel good, to feel confident. And you know, generally a guy and, and, and Butch and I agree on what we all want. So the consensus is there. So you, know, you want to get to a point where you have a car that's under you 
uh, where you're just making small changes, and that's generally what we do. And, and with, with cars that are this fast at this speed, you need instant feedback uh, because <laughs> you're, you're traveling so fast, you're covering so much ground in a very short amount of time that if if, if, if you're slow to process what the car is doing, it's probably too late. You know, so, so you really have to be on top of the car, and from the moment you put your foot on the brake, you know, to, to, to be either from the seat of your pants or visually or whatever, to know if the car is starting to rotate a little bit, uh, or, or to know if, if the rear wheels are starting to lock up from the brakes, uh, or, or we're on the front, front brakes. I mean, there's, I mean there, there's, there's literally so much stimulus coming into your brain, and you're trying to filter out what's noise and what's valuable. And, uh, and that's probably one of the biggest tricks and one of the things that where experience comes into play the most, where, where you're able to just intuitively, you know, just to say, you know, your brain without even thinking about it, just says, you know, that, I don't care about that. But, but, you know, but, but the car going backwards, that, that actually becomes pretty important. Uh, with a prototype, the uh, high speed, basically at the point when you enter the corner, uh, when you start to brake, um, the car's attitude is very important because of the arrow, because of the fact that you need the front to be um, consistent and the rear to be consistent. So if the car is pitching too far forward, then you get an abundance of front downforce and a lack of rear downforce. Uh, and if you land it like a plane too much, not like that, like that, with the back coming in kind of first, um, if you do that too much, then you just get understeer. So as soon as you turn in, it's straight to understeer, and then then you're kind of done at that point anyway. You're doing damage control from there on out. So when you when you can land it in the right attitude to gain downforce, you try to keep that consistent front to rear, and you don't want to move that around too much. That's the main thing. Oh, uh, when they put different aerodynamic configurations on the car, that's one of the easiest things to feel, and you feel it immediately. And the aerodynamic uh, shows up more at the higher speeds you go. Uh, in testing, we, we tried a few different configurations, and, and a couple of them, it absolutely just welded the front of the car to the ground uh, and, and, and just made it so that it, it went wherever you turned it. Now, sometimes it's hard, though. You have to make sure you have a balance, because uh, if the front's stuck to the ground but the rear isn't, it, it rotates pretty easily. So. so you know, that, that's always the challenge is, you know, nothing ever comes without a cost. So if you, you know, you can, you can put all the downforce you want on one end or the other, but in, unless they work in concert, uh, you, you don't go any faster, you go slower. There's so many, there's so many variables. I mean, you know, in terms of corner entry, I mean, you, you know, so you've got braking forces, uh, braking pressure. Uh, different drivers do different things. Some guys brake earlier and softer. Some guys brake right at the last minute and big brake pressure and get the car on the nose. Um, also with the diff, you know, you can have a more open diff which makes the car more free, which means that, you know, it will, will tend to turn into the corner better and be a little bit more open. Um, if the car's oversteering, for example, off the throttle, we may make a diff change and tighten the diff up, tighten the preload up in the diff so that when we come off the throttle, there's still some, so some, uh, some preload in the diff which will stop the car from rotating. At the same time as you're going in the corner and you're turning your hands, you're, you might be squeezing the brake pedal or you might be coming off the brake pedal and as you come off the brake pedal you, you might also be playing with the gas pedal and with the diff you could like come into the corner you turn in and the car is wanting to push a little bit and you can roll off the throttle and with the tuning of the diff you can actually make the back of the car slide a little bit and help the driver point the front of the car where he wants to go as soon as the front of the car is pointed where he wants to go he can pick the throttle back up and you have ways of tuning that. You can help tune the car to be throttle sensitive to, what, to help turn the car. Or you can open the diff so the car rolls through the corner and, and the throttle doesn't affect the, the, the balance change of the car. And, um, and you can tune the amount of time it takes for the car to hook up both rear wheels together coming off the corner. So you can time management. It's just, again, it's like shocks. It's time management. The, the diff, you can, you can help yourself when you downshift the, the car to a lower gear, it applies torque to the diff and it runs it up ramps inside the diff with lock the rear wheels together. But you can time how soon the lockup happens or if it happens at all with an adjustment on the diff called the coast side. Then when the driver is steady state in the middle of the corner, not asking for anything out of the car, Generally the diff 
if set up, can be open so the car can rotate nice and smooth. And then as he picks up the throttle to accelerate off the corner, then the diff as, as the differential accelerates, the ramps expand again and lock the two rear wheels together to drive the car off the corner. And you can do that as a timing thing so you don't, just don't pick up throttle-induced understeer. You could actually let one wheel spin a little bit while you're actually getting drive with the loaded wheel off the corner. And there's all different types of diffs and there's all different types of tuning, types of way of tuning diffs to do that. They have negative preload diffs. They have diffs you can, like ours, where you can do uh, coast and power. Uh, so, but they're very, very strong tools to help the driver get the car into the corner and out of the corner. And they also can be used to help stabilize the car under braking because at some places that have long straightaways, if the two rear wheels are kind of independent of each other, the brakes might warm up at different rates and the car will get pulled around and wiggle under the brakes. But if you lock the diff together a little tighter or so, as they apply the brakes, the car brakes in a straight line and very confident. But when you do that, if you go to a street circuit, and the diff is too tight, you'll just have push everywhere. So you have to be able to open the diff up. Generally though, we would start the car fairly tight on diff to give the car a comfortable push until the driver gets his head into the track. And as he gets quicker with the track, you slowly open the diff back up to make it where he can be more aggressive and not have so much push. And you, you hope you don't go over the top and get it where you get wheel spin at both rear wheels and kick the back out and touch the wall with the back of the car or so. But you know, generally you start with a car that pushes quite a bit and then start freeing it up. So as they apply throttle, they can be more aggressive and get off the corner. It's all about track conditions. Uh, if, you, if you have low grip track conditions, like start of a weekend, uh, then you, you don't want to chase that and go just for that condition because it's going to be different when you come back tomorrow. Um, but you can also not do anything. You, you want to try to make the car better and learn from it if you can. So you, have a, you set up for a low grip circuit and then you try to compensate as the track gets better. And that's where an engineer earns his money. It's not coming up with the original ideas. The idea is we've all reinvented the wheel a hundred times and it's, it's still a wheel, still the same size. Honestly, it's, it's what it is. So how you adjust to the track is a huge part of success. Uh, especially on low speed because then when you gain grip and you don't have um, vertical to depend on and all that then if you've done your homework as an engineer and the driver's doing his job you're going to be faster in the low speed sections because you've you've spent time on that you've made your car you've compromised your car maybe a little bit further to that side to the slow speed side um, maybe a little bit softer than it lacks in the high speed but if if that compromise only hurts you a tenth in a high speed corner and you gain six tenths from it everywhere else, that's a half a second to the good. So you, you've automatically gained. Um, one thing that's also important to remember is you spend way less time in high speed corners on any track than you do in low speed corners. Just the nature of physics. You, you're, you're in there longer because you're down at 30 miles an hour and you're going, you know, so you spend a lot more time in the slower speed stuff. So that's, a, your lap time's in the low speed. It definitely is. So. So it doesn't render itself to prototype as much, but you know it lends itself more to GT. So it's always a compromise. Really, so just too much max man, right? Yeah. Okay. It's just pivoting a bit too much. Like carry, if you carry speed in, it's, it's, so, up on its, it's all these little things. I mean, all the time you're thinking, well, is it the diff? Is it the braking? You know, is it the downforce? Is it the mechanical? And there's all these things that you're trying to sort of compute in your mind. I mean, you're driving the pit lane, and you're sort of huffing and puffing, and you know, you're thinking about the driving. You come in and say, okay, so what do you need? And, and almost you've got to sort of, you know, in sort of 10, 15 seconds, you've got to analyze it. Your brain's going like crazy, trying to process all the information and then say, okay, this, 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 this. Okay, this is the most important thing. This is what I need right now. This is going to make me go faster. Um, and using it in the pit lane, you don't have a lot of time to think about it. Of course, when you come back after the session, you can sit down with the engineers, with a cup of tea, look at the data and you can, and you can analyze it a little bit more clearly. But generally in the pit lane, it's those split decisions. And that split decision could be, send you the right way, it could also send you the wrong way. So over time and with experience, you tend to be able to, like I say, go by the, by the feel and really kind of know just exactly what it is that you want, so.